If you were to ask most people of a certain age to name a famous British aircraft of the Second World War, they would almost certainly say the Supermarine Spitfire. It's become an icon of that conflict, and with good reason. The story of its development by Reginald Joseph Mitchell is one of British engineering excellence overcoming adversity in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. Although the Spitfire is indeed iconic, and there are even roughly 60 flying examples to be seen and enjoyed around the world, there are still some aspects of this amazing aircraft that are relatively unknown, even to many aviation enthusiasts. So let's talk about some of the amazing things that this legendary aircraft achieved during its operational career. When the Spitfire first flew in March of 1936 and Mutt Summers, the chief test pilot for Vickers, uttered those famous words, the aircraft was already revolutionary. Not only was it a monoplane, but it was also the first all-metal construction British fighter to date. At least it certainly became all-metal later on. What really set it apart was its wing design. The Type A Spitfire wing, with its distinctive elliptical shape, was not just an aesthetically pleasing design choice. The elliptical wing had been mathematically proven to create less drag and to be more efficient than traditional shaped wings. This gave the Spitfire a crucial advantage in terms of speed and manoeuvrability over its contemporaries, both friend and foe. Interestingly enough, the entire idea had been stolen from a German design and had made its way into Reginald Mitchell's workshop by the mind of Canadian Beverly Shenston. Shenston had actually been recruited to spy on the German aircraft industry in the late 1920s by the British government. It was by shadowing Alexander Martin Lippisch, a German wing specialist, that Shepston was able to unlock the secret to faster flight. By the way, Lippisch is a fascinating character who was years ahead of his time. He's well worth researching if you want to find out more. Of all the benefits that the elliptical wing gave the Spitfire, the most serendipitous was the natural stall warning it gave its pilots. Due to its design, a Spitfire wing wouldn't suddenly lose lift and stall. It would first start to shake, which told an experienced pilot what was about to happen. In his book, First Light, Jeffrey Wellham describes dogfight maneuvers against an ME-109. If you want to shake someone off your tail, you have to fly your Spitfire to its limits. In a tight turn, you increase the G-loading to such an extent that the wings can no longer support the weight and the plane stalls, with momentary loss of control. However, in a Spitfire, just before the stall, the whole aircraft judders. It's a stall warning, if you like. With practice and experience, you can hold the plane on this judder in a very tight turn. You never actually stall the aircraft and you don't need to struggle to regain control because you never lose it. A 109 can't stay with you. So ultimately, it was the Germans who gave the British the weapon that was to go on to shoot down more enemy aircraft than any other Allied fighter if somewhat indirectly. Being the only British fighter that remained in production throughout the Second World War, the Spitfire encountered almost every enemy aircraft. This included the new generation of jets that started rolling off German production lines in the latter years of the conflict. Contrary to what Hollywood films might want us to believe, the first jet fighter was not down by P-51's sporting red tails. It wasn't even shot down by P-47's out of ammunition. The credit for the first aerial jet kill goes to the Supermarine Spitfire. That being said, it was not a British squadron who achieved this feat of arms, but rather a Canadian outfit flying its dated Mark IX Spitfires. While flying over the Netherlands in October 1944, a five-strong flight of Spitfires from 401 Squadron, Royal Canadian Air Force, encountered a Messerschmitt ME-262 from KG-51. This fast fighter was being piloted by Hauptmann Hans Christoph Butman, who despite his speed advantage, chose to stay and fight. Unfortunately, the decision was to cost him his life. Despite putting up a spirited resistance, according to the combat report, the quintuplet of Spitfires was too much for the lone ME-262. Caught in the sights of several of the Spitfires, the aircraft fell to the earth in flames. 401 Squadron would go on to shoot down more jet aircraft, this time three Arado AR-234 jet bombers of KG-76 in January 1945. This goes to show that even the huge advancement that the ME-262 represented was not enough to stem the tide of defeat that surrounded Nazi Germany by 1944. The Spitfire still had teeth, and she wasn't afraid to use them. Jet aircraft were not the only weapons that the German high command hoped would turn the tide of war. 
In June 1944, the British population was first targeted by an unmanned flying bomb, known universally as the V-1. This was followed in September by the much more destructive V-2 ballistic missile. As a kid, I was well aware of the V-1 flying bomb as both my grandparents could remember them flying over the very house that I lived in. My grandfather also told me a story about his encounter with the V-1 shortly after he joined up with the RAF. He was walking with some other cadets through a London park when they suddenly heard the deep humming of the doodlebug flying towards them. Then suddenly, the sound stopped. My grandfather said that they all knew it was coming down right on top of them and they rushed for cover. Unfortunately, one of the lads was not quick enough and he was killed along with several others. As frightening as that must have been, the V2 gave absolutely no warning and this meant that something had to be done about them and fast. Relatively speaking, V1s were easy to counter. Once a defense had been hastily arranged, relatively few V1s made it to their target. A combination of anti-aircraft fire and patrolling fighters saw many V1s explode mid-air or crash into the sea or into the Kentish countryside. The RAF also targeted the fixed launching positions of the V1, codenamed Operation Crossbow. However, the V2 was a different kettle of fish entirely. In response to the attacks on their V1 sites, the Germans began launching V2s from mobile facilities, which were harder to find and attack with bombers. During an Operation Crossbow meeting, it was decided that a more dynamic approach was needed, and the best aircraft for the job was the newer clip-wing Mark 16 Spitfire. Dubbed Operation Big Ben, after the code name for the V2s themselves, squadrons were quickly put into training. According to Flight Lieutenant Raymond Baxter of 602 City of Glasgow Squadron, the Spitfires would perform 70 to 75 degree dives on the V2 sites in close formation. This gave their 500 and twin 250 pound bombs the best chance of hitting the target. Spitfires were also sent out on pinpoint attacks against enemy infrastructure, such as railway lines and bridges, anything to slow the rate at which the Germans could launch these deadly weapons. It's estimated that over 3,000 V2s were launched in the last months of the war, and roughly 1,500 hit London itself. However, this was a fraction of the 6,048 V2s that were reportedly built by the Nazi regime. In aerial combat, it's often said that victory doesn't depend on the machine, but rather on the pilot at the controls. This was certainly the case in the next story, where Spitfires found themselves fighting other Spitfires. By 1948, a war-weary Britain that was still reeling from the loss of its Indian colony was faced with a deteriorating situation in the Middle East. Jews were demanding a homeland, and the British were looking to extricate themselves from the region as swiftly as possible. During the build-up to declaring Israel a state, Jewish freedom fighters looked to arm themselves both on the ground and in the air. The fledgling Israeli Air Force, just like the Chinese Air Force a decade earlier, called for foreign volunteers and aircraft. As the call was answered, Jewish and Gentile Israeli Air Force pilots faced the biggest rivals in the region, the Royal Egyptian Air Force and also the British Royal Air Force, which was still monitoring the region. All three air forces were equipped with an assortment of aircraft, including various marks of the Supermarine Spitfire. With a conflict looming, the chance of a Spitfire versus Spitfire showdown seemed inevitable. Around midday on January the 7th, 1949, two patrolling Israeli Air Force pilots in Supermarine Spitfires spotted a column of black smoke rising from the Sinai Desert. As they drew nearer, they saw what appeared to be an Israeli Defense Force motorized column under attack. The pilots naturally assumed the Spitfires they could see were being operated by the Royal Egyptian Air Force. Although one hostile Spitfire had already been shot down by the IDF gunfire and was smoking on the ground, three others were still circling. The Israeli Air Force duo raced to the rescue. Within minutes, all three remaining enemy aircraft had been shot down by the Israeli Spits. The trouble was, the pilots flying the downed planes were wearing Royal Air Force uniforms. The Israeli Air Force pilots realized too late that their adversaries were actually British reconnaissance Spitfires, whose pilots had also been attracted by the smoke. Confusion that led to the fatal misidentification. What's more, the Israeli Spitfires were not being flown by Israelis either. One was piloted by a Canadian World War II ace, and the other by an American former test pilot. And both Israeli Air Force volunteers had seen action during World War II 
flying in British cockpits. In the closing days of Israel's war for independence, four Mark 18 Spitfires from RAF 208 Squadron had been sent out to establish the position of Israeli forces in northeast Sinai. Led by flying officer Cooper, he was followed by his wingman, Sergeant Frank Close, and flying officer McElhall and Sergeant Ron Sayers. The pilots were instructed not to cross into Israeli territory. Around the same time near Rafa, five Royal Egyptian Air Force Spitfire 9s had strafed an Israeli motorized column, setting three trucks on fire. When they saw the black smoke, the RAF planes went to investigate and take photographs. The Israeli soldiers thought they were under attack again from the Egyptians, and so opened fire with machine guns, hitting two of the RAF aircraft. Close's Spitfire caught fire almost immediately and he managed to climb to 500 feet and bail out, breaking his jaw during the landing. The other Spitfire, flown by Cooper, wasn't damaged as much and he managed to climb away from the ground fire. The other two RAF Spitfires then also descended to see what was going on. This is when two patrolling Israeli 101 Squadron Spitfire 9s arrived on scene. They were flown by Royal Canadian Air Force Ace John McElroy and American Chalmers Slick Goodland also ex-Royal Canadian Air Force and former US Navy test pilot. The two Israeli Air Force volunteers saw the three circling RAF Spitfires and assumed that they were Egyptians attacking their convoy. Generally, the Israeli Air Force flew in two ship formations and treated any larger groups as hostile. Surprisingly, for two native English speakers who still had RAF radios in their aircraft, McElroy and Goodlin failed to link the excited English voices discussing Close's loss with what was happening below them. Instead, they prepared to attack. For the three remaining RAF pilots, if they saw the diving Spitfires, they must have believed them to be friendly. After all, the approaching Israeli Air Force Spitfires still wore the British-style camouflage and red air screw spinners. Before the British realised the danger, McElroy had fired a burst into Sayers' aircraft killing him and leaving his Spitfire a smoking wreck on the ground. The Canadian then turned his attention to McElhor's Spitfire. He later said, I took one look and saw it wasn't one of ours by the markings. Ours had tails painted with big red and white stripes. So I dropped my sights on him. It was about 400 yards and I let fly. In the other cockpit, McElhor recalled, the first sign I had of trouble was an RT call. Look out. There's one behind you. I looked out. I saw one behind me. That was the end of it. I was simply shot down while orbiting Close's wreckage. With two British Spitfires downed, the last RAF pilot, Cooper, was well aware of the danger and was prepared to fight. Goodlin, in the Israeli Air Force Spitfire, later reported, I could not gain close proximity to the Spitfire 18 due to the lesser power in my Spit 9. At about 16,000 feet, the Spitfire 18 rolled over and dived back towards me at an impossible deflection angle, with machine guns blazing and exhaust smoke rolling out under both wings. Perhaps lacking the power of the later Mark Spitfire, Good Goodlin was still an accomplished pilot and took advantage of the Spitfire 9's greater maneuverability. Getting into position, Goodlin managed to shoot Cooper down. He later said, I only recognised the RF roundels after the Spitfire 18 had fired on me when we were in the scissors engagement and I had no alternative but to fight back to save my bacon. At the end of the fight, one British pilot lay dead in his aircraft, two were captured by the Israelis and the flight leader Cooper was wandering around the desert trying to evade capture. Israelis feared British retaliation. They did eventually get a demand from the British government for compensation for the loss of equipment and personnel. Instead, 208 Squadron received a note from the Israeli Air Force saying, Sorry about yesterday, but you were on the wrong side of the fence. Come over and have a drink sometime. You will see many familiar faces. Many of us have participated in crowdfunding goals to bring a new piece of technology or service to life. Or, like in my case, to help out a friend who had suffered a recent loss. But did you know that an estimated 1,500 Spitfires were crowdfunded during the Second World War? It's thought that this number could even be as high as 2,600 Spits. As you can imagine, fighting a war is a very expensive endeavour, and the British government was still reeling from the effects of the Great Depression. 
Many of those in government also still remembered the crippling cost of the Great War. Relying entirely on the national coffers probably wasn't going to enable them to fight the new war that broke out in 1939. Then something strange started to happen. I once asked my grandfather what made his generation prepare to fight the Second World War. He tried to explain to me that there was never a question of not fighting it. There was a job to be done and everyone just did their bit. Nevertheless, the feeling in 1939 was very different from that of the crowds celebrating the outbreak of the war in 1914. This is why the role of propaganda was so important. The British public needed inspiration and, more importantly, they needed to feel like they could make a difference to the war effort. Enter the Spitfire. This beautiful aircraft was already making a name for itself, even during the phony war, and some members of the public felt so strongly about its importance for the war effort that they sent donations to the war office. Lord Beaverbrook, the Canadian-British newspaper magnet, was put in charge of aircraft production. He was quick to recognise this trend and monopolise on it, and so he launched the Spitfire Fund across the entire Commonwealth. This wasn't a new concept, the idea of crowdfunding military equipment goes back to at least the American Civil War. During the Napoleonic Wars, it wasn't unheard of for a British aristocrat to raise his own regiment and go off to fight Johnny Crapo in Spain. Although a Spitfire cost nearer £13,000 to produce at the time, the price to fully fund your own Spit was set at just £5,000. To further encourage the general public to part with their coppers, each component part of the fighter was given a price. This meant that a housewife could donate sixpence and know she'd funded an additional spark plug. A scout troop might donate a fuel tank for £40. Your local union might have a whip round to fund the left wing of a spit, and so on. The Spitfire Fund scheme was a huge success and whipped the public into a crowdfunding frenzy. Towns and communities vied against each other to see who could raise the most money for the fund, and the result was an estimated £13 million, approximately £650 million today. The Spitfire is truly an iconic aircraft, and there are still stories to be told about it nearly a hundred years after it first made its maiden flight. Let me know in the comments which of the five facts you found the most interesting. Also, do you know any that I should share in a future video? Thanks for watching and give this video a like if you made it this far.